Okay, hello and welcome. I am from NASPA. Lisa Wilkinson is my name and I'm from Hawaii. And I just wanted to welcome you and tell you a little bit about our wonderful speaker. We have Katie Garner today. She is an internationally known speaker, author, and literacy consultant with 25 years of experience in elementary grade classrooms across the US and a passion for infusing neuroscience into literacy and learning. Her fast-paced, dynamic presentations spotlight brain-changing strategies for boosting existing reading curriculum and phonics instruction with the latest neural research, showing how our brains learn best. Katie's backdoor to the brain approach to reading and writing skill mastery via the effective feeling domain has been shared in both lectures and panel discussions at Harvard and MIT. I am so excited to learn from Katie today, as I'm sure you are too. If you are in a classroom and you're at an early grade level, you are building with the code. You are reading and writing across the instructional day. If you are in an upper grade with the class, uh, with upper grade students, the code is the bridge that you have to cross to get to everything that you're trying to accomplish across the instructional day. So no matter what your perspective is, the code can often really be a big blockade in our path for everything that we are trying to do and everything that learners really need to have deep in the gut ownership of in order to be successful and lifelong learners. There are a lot of landmines that come with this thing called the code or phonics, but those landmines are obliterated when you look at what we can do going through the back door instead of the front and using brain science as a roadmap. So that's our focus today and everything that you're gonna see as you download this um, will give you kind of these hands-on pieces that you need. You're also gonna see clickable links in the form of those arrows throughout the packet. Just to tell you very, very fast, those are gonna let you dig deeper into things that I'm gonna shoot by so quickly in this hour and it will absolutely leave you with questions. So there are a couple ways those questions can be answered. One is fleshing it out with the arrows that will take you to either YouTube videos, um, PD stuff, uh, uh, research links. There's so many different aspects of those, those arrows <clears throat> to round out things that we're gonna explore today. The other one is something called Secret Sunday, and I put a little link up here. Every Sunday during this high conference season time, I am doing a live YouTube at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you are welcome to jump on. And basically, we kind of pick up where we left off in a session, but for different points. So one time it might be um, uh, looking at different ways to use music that are not at all the way you use it in the classroom, based on the brain research and what shows us is the best use for it. Another time might be specific to brain-based phonics games. Um, it could be how to accelerate or fast track access to the code specifically for transfer and writing. So there's all kinds of really interesting twists on things that you're struggling with day to day. And then the best part are questions and answers live. So with between the groups that are in the chats who are usually incredible teachers that are just as able as I am to give so many ideas. Um, and then me responding directly, that's a great follow-up kind of virtual coffee time for us to have after this session as well, especially since Sunday's just two days from now. Um, the last thing I want to tell you is raise your hand if you're in kinder or in first or you have a high ELL population. Okay, this is going to be your best friend and this is the better alphabet. And I don't mean just those pictures, I mean this thing called the better alphabet. I am not going to say too much about it. The last two Secret Sundays were about it, so you'll have everything you need to know in those and also in these clickable links and you can tab it all. But the reason you're going to want to know it is it will knock out your individual letters and sounds in two weeks to two months. And you're done. And that acquisition time is identical for pre-K and in kinder. So there's no difference at all between a four-year-old and a five-year-old in terms of grabbing those individual letters and sounds in two weeks to two months because we're avoiding this higher level processing area and tapping into muscle memory to do it. The higher level processing area is where you have a lot of those pitfalls, you know, especially if a little guy wants to just lick the carpet and play with his shoe because he's five and he's not interested in what G says or that T is the same sound that's in the word Tom. That, that's all relative to someone who knows what Tom looks like and how you spell Tom and you know, who Tom is. So those kinds of conversations can take a, lo a long year to teach if you're trying to break your way through the front door. The key is always going around the back. That's gonna be the theme of everything we're gonna do in this hour. 
but the better alphabet is the first step to really cheating and getting around something that is otherwise just a big time sucker for the course of your year. So definitely check out this better alphabet if you do work with kids and that takes up so much of your time because that paired with what we're gonna be talking about as we move forward, it's those things together, those two things together that are really gonna power up what happens in your classroom. Now most of us, or a lot of us, actually, some of, many of you are in early grades, some of you are not. So the code is more than just T or TH. And one of the biggest things that we're going to look at is how we teach it, how we spread it across grade levels, and how much that ties learners' hands to really see the, the use in reading and writing with a code that they only have a third of for the whole first year. You know, if I have a pet mouse and I want to write about my pet mouse and it is kinder or even first grade, I could stare at my alphabet train all day long and I will never find the letter that says owl because it is not up there. And by the time I get it, if I use a standard reading series, the standard reading series, and they're all broken down actually, you can see some of those on these links, which is fascinating. The scope and sequences are broken down so you can see which parts of the code kids get in which grade level. The OUOW is traditionally taught in second grade. Well, my mouse is very likely to be dead by then. And I will not want to write about him at that time. I want to write about him right now when I have him. And so the part of the code that I need to read or to write about what's exciting to me, I won't get for another year and a half. Or two years if I'm in kinder. Or three years, really, if it's the beginning of kinder. That's way too long to wait for access to the whole code, especially when you need it first thing. Because we're reading and writing across the instructional day from as early as the time they walk into school. So the question that we really want to kind of have running in the back of our mind throughout today is, with what? What do my kids actually have to read and write with? What do they have? What has my reading series given them to bring to the table so they can actually kind of dive in and partake in this activity armed with enough of the code to do something with it? And then when they walk away, of course, the more you bring to the table, the more value you take away. So if all you have is a B, D, and a P, that's not going to give you very much to use to dive into this story or to tell me what happened over your holiday break. So if you think about it like that and you really step a, take a step back, you start to visualize this elephant in the room that we have to really work around. And it is the basis of the problem that you see in third, fourth, and fifth grade when kids have missed these bus stops with the code along the way at the early grades, especially with developmental readiness being a core, a core focal point. So all of that to say the gap between what we know and what we do is wide. It's also a wide gap between what we want to do and what we do. Because in a perfect world, we would want kids to be armed with what they need to really partake and take advantage of the rich literacy experiences we give them through the day. But the truth is, if you teach kinder or you teach first, and I'm gonna get to the way this looks at those other grade levels as well, but if you teach at the earliest possible grade levels, you're at the biggest disadvantage because your kids have the least of the code to work with. And the parts of the code they do have or the sounds the letters are the least likely to say, which really makes reinforcing what letters and sounds are going to be assessed on their, on their testing difficult because your test just wants kids to say t when they see a T. But in real life, T will almost never say t. Because every time they see it in real text, it's paired with the letter H. And 99% of the time, words like this, they, them, that, and the are going to outnumber words like turtle and Toronto. So that's just one example, but it makes your life really tough if you teach at an early grade level or you're working with ELL kids trying to make sense out of something that just seems to contradict itself all the time. And if you work with an upper grade, there are just enough contradic contradictions to go around for you as well. Because how things are spelled, how they're sounded out, it seems like we're always having to say those magic words. It just is, it just does, you just have to remember. And those are the brain's worst enemy. So the gap between what we know, what we do is wide, and the research on the brain, and especially on brain plasticity, and where things are processed, and how we can mark information in the brain just based on how we wrap up what we're tossing out, all of those things give us a whole different pathway to access the areas that kids need to store this in, and they're not the areas that are their weakest points, which right now, the higher level processing center is not our best friend for struggling upper grade or early grade learners. So this is the gap that we're going to kind of play in. Now I mentioned this just briefly with the T, but just think of all the other times that letters just don't seem to ever do what they should. And again, it's the worst scenario at the beginning grade levels because they have the least of the code to use to make sense of it. We tell kids, Y says yo, yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but it won't, <laughs> almost ever. As a matter of fact, the minute you walk to your calendar, you're gonna show them almost every possible example of what Y says, and none of it is gonna be yeah, because <laughs> they're gonna see words like July, January, E, M, A, A, um, every uh, month of the year, every day of the week has a Y at the end, and it can say E, it can say I, it can say A. We've got every big book that's but I, a certain author. We've got the but always bathroom. To a kid, it seems like every time they turn around, that letter Y makes a whole different sound. The only thing the brain, as a pattern-making machine, can really walk away with and be sure about is it won't say yeah. Because unless the words yellow, yes, yesterday, or yak, good luck finding the letter Y doing the one thing that at the earliest grade levels is on our assessment for the end of the year for kids to say when they see that Y. The positional sounds of Y is actually held off for second grade. That typically falls in a second grade scope and sequence for a reading series. That's a lot of time spent in the classroom being hit with these inconsistencies and the brain trying to figure out what's up, what, how, I, don't, I need a way, I don't have a compass for this. I don't even know how to get my bearings when it comes to what I should try first when I see this letter. And upper grade kids really struggle with this, ELL kids especially so, because this is one of the, the most, I call it a high leverage skill, because you get a lot of bang for the buck out of it if you know how to wield it, how to use it. If you don't, it can seem to be kind of a monkey wrench in almost every every other word you try to read. I already mentioned TH, and our language is just rampant with inconsistencies that actually can be worked with from a morphological perspective, but these are little guys who want to lick the carpet and eat their shoe. So those higher level linguistic conversations don't always work well with the audience that is our mainstay for these base beginning um, sounds and skills. So it does really make it tricky for teachers to ingrain this information in kids and then to maximize the value of all the reading and writing we do all day long with the skills. Now the best example I can give just to transform our perspective of front door, back door and how one looks compared to the other is to demonstrate an example. And if you've ever heard me speak, I almost always do this example, but I'm, I'm gonna go in a different direction with it. But this example is just a great one, I think, because it's usually the beginning of the year when we see the calendar, and this is the month that's on it. And when we see this month, and by the way, I should also tell you this, I'm gonna demonstrate this little example at the earliest possible grade level with the most confused learners because I wanna mimic the worst case scenario you could be experiencing in your fourth or fifth grade class. So no matter how um, lost you might think certain kids are in your upper grade classroom, less than a kindergartner. It's not possible. Especially a first day kindergartner because they don't know who they are, where they are, what they're doing. So it's a perfect fertile ground to see impact. So on this first day of school, you've got your typical criers, yellers, screamers. You've got one little guy. He came in. He's got a note pinned to his chest. It's from mom. It says, I'm gifted. So he has to get a quick assessment, and it can't be a formal assessment because mom's already called twice. She wants to move to first grade, maybe second. She's open to your input, but she wants to call back at lunch, which is just going to be in about 30 minutes because we're in an overcrowded school, and lunch starts at 9.50. So it's time to do a quick informal assessment, and the fastest thing I can get my hands on is the calendar. So I asked Johnny if he can tell me what that word is. And he actually surprises me because he does a really good job. He goes, ah, ah, ug, us, ah, ug, us, ah, ug, us. Now, if you're not in kindergarten, that may not sound that impressive to you, <laughs> but if you are in kindergarten and you have a kid who can spit out those sounds that fast and do it in a way that shows he's trying to blend them together to come up with something like the word, that's amazing. So you would probably say, that's really great. You're, you're a good little reader. I love the way you tried to attack that word. Now, honey, the word's actually August, but way to go. Really good job. Now, if he's really gifted, that won't sit real well because he's confused and he's probably going to say, well, why? Why is it August? Because I don't, the A goes ah, 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 and it goes A, but O goes ah, ah, ah. There's no O in that word. How come that word's August? Now, that's a brilliant deduction. His brain is working as a pattern making machine. He's laying out all the patterns he brought to the table and he's wanting me to make what I just said fit. And that's our brain's method of business. It's a constant struggle to connect patterns we own with new patterns that we see so that we can go, oh, I get it. And if we can connect them, if we can find the common ground of if not this, then that, and there's a perfectly logical reason for it, then we walk away and own that new information. If we can't connect it and we're left with this, huh, I don't get, that doesn't make, based on what I know, that doesn't, there's no possible way that would make any sense. If we have a disconnect, that's information that isn't easily owned. That information has to be repetitiously practiced and used. 
in order to work its way into the thinking network. So that's not our preferred method because we don't want to have to repeatedly practice things, especially when we have kids who aren't going to get the repeated practice. We've got kids who don't have opportunities for practice at home. We've got kids who maybe don't have parents at home to practice with them. We've got kids who don't even have a home. <laughs> so we've got a lot of kids that if repetitious use and practice is their route to literacy, they're going to be on an unlevel playing field from day one. So ideally, we want to work with the brain system, which means we have to make sense. So when Johnny asks why, right now in the front door world, our answer is often, it just is, it just does, you just have to remember. But I'll help you. We're going to march to the door every single day in the month of August, and we're going to go August, August, August. And if we do that for 21 days, probably by the end of August, you will know what August is until September and October when we stop marching with the word August, and then you might forget and we'll have to march again. Under so we try to come up with fun ways to repetitiously practice stuff that we can't make make sense. But ideally, we want to feed the why. And this is where we can make that happen when we take some backdoor routes. So I'm going to tell Johnny a secret. Now, I'm going to tell him what I call a grown-up reading and writing secret. And the thing is, is these secrets are big. And if I tell you a secret that your brain isn't big enough to hear yet, your brain could explode. And I don't want that to happen, so I have to be really careful to make sure that your brain's big enough to hear the secret that's in this word. Now, I will say if you teach kinder, be careful, because if you say that, you'll set your criers back off again. So don't tell them your brain will explode lest they know your sense of humor. But there's a significant motivational factor behind it, which is I've got it, you want it, I'll decide if you could have it, but it's big. I wouldn't hold my breath. I've never actually told a kindergarten class this secret ever. I've actually never even told a first grade class this secret. Other than, I think I had one class in first grade that I told the secret to, but it was like after the holiday. But I'm going to tell you guys the secret for two reasons. One is, Johnny, you asked, which tells me I think you're ready. And the other reason is that you guys, the rest of you, are looking at me like you can't wait to hear what I'm about to say. Now, why are they looking at me like they can't wait to hear what I'm about to say? It's a secret. Yeah, they don't know a letter from a number from a squirrel. So the rest of them have no idea what Johnny and I are even talking about. And they would have no interest in this entire line of conversation had I not said the magic word, secret. And there's an immediate trigger, a need-to-know trigger, that you toss when you say the word secret. Now, this is actually a key piece because what we know is teachable moments are, are golden. They're easy to get with kids who have an intellectual curiosity, like Johnny, who's going to say, why, 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 all day. He's easy to teach to because he's always got a need to know. The kid who doesn't know enough to know what he needs to know is harder to teach to because first we have to focus him in, and then we have to try to set up something that would be interesting, and then once we set up the problem, then we can show him the solution to a problem he didn't even know he had, and that's if he pays attention long enough to follow the whole line of thought. A secret is a different situation. When you can trigger a need to know in the brain, the information that you put in there is going to be marked for memory and prioritized learning, which means it's going down a different chute. If you toss out something nobody asks for, nobody wants, and nobody cares about, it's like throwing a ball to an empty field. You might get lucky and hit someone on the back, but the odds are slim. If you really want to make sure that the ball that you throw is caught so that they can use it to retrieve it and give it back to you, you've got to have a need to know in place first. So how do you get a need to know in a kid who has no need to know? Secret. It's a quick cheating way. And the interesting thing is the brain doesn't discern or discriminate between why you need to know. The need to know is a heightened state of physiological alert. It's like a heightened adrenaline rise. So it doesn't really matter that Johnny has a real valid academic need to know and Lulu just wants to know the secret. The, the outcome is the same in terms of that information that you toss out at that moment being marked from memory in the brain. So that's a fascinating find because it lets us get the same value from kids who aren't where other kids are and yet what we say isn't going to have to be said 14 times. It's not going to fall on deaf ears. Now having said that, what you say has to click. So I'm going to tell them that there are two letters in this word August that are in love. And I don't mean a little bit in love. I mean these guys have a huge crush on each other. They are actually A and U. Now, you're going to have these in your download. They're A and U, and it's actually not just A and U that are in love. A and W are in love, too, but, you know, they're not in this word. But anytime you see these letters right up against each other in a word side by side, they get so embarrassed that they always put their heads down and say, Ah, yeah, you guys knew before I even said it. Ah, like in this word, look, not just August, but look over here, awful. Look at this word, awesome. Look at his name tag, Austin. Look at all the words that have this grown-up reading and writing secret. 
Now, if you didn't know the secret, you'd think this word was uh, awful. You'd think this word was awesome. And you might even call him Austin. But see, now you know that grown-up reading and writing secret. Now, that lets different kids do different things. Johnny does what we thought. He goes, ah! He gives us a nice big brain burp. That's what the brain does when it gets fed. When you give the brain a way to account for a discrepancy, which means you've connected the patterns together, the new with the old, he gets to walk away with the new information already there. Why? Because it makes sense. We don't have to memorize things that make sense. Like if, if Susie cries, I remember and I can tell the substitute Susie cries because I understand why she cries. She cries all the time because her mom is in the military and she misses her and so she cries. The kid didn't have to go home and practice that in his journal. He didn't have to memorize that for a test. It made sense. So he knows it and it's a perfectly logical explanation. So that's the golden part of the brain. That's where we want to play because when we put things there, they don't go away. But Johnny is not the important person. Lulu is. Now, the best way to describe Lulu, because I used to describe a fictional Lulu that was a group of all this, the Lulus I've had, but then I met a real Lulu at a conference. Like, I've had multiple real Lulus, but this was a better Lulu because she had no reason to even be there, and it wasn't really a conference. It was a district PD. So it was a professional development, and I usually, when I do that, I break K2 or pre-K2 apart from 3-5. So the 3-5 was in the afternoon, and this was a daughter of one of the teachers, and she was brought to this, this you know, multi-hour PD, very well behaved, sat there the entire time and just played with her mom's phone. Perfectly behaved. Only looked up one time, and that was when she heard me say, where did it go? How could I lose something? And I haven't moved two feet. <laughs> ah, thank you. I should have like this many people around me all day long when I'm losing everything. Um, I was holding this up, and I said, Ah, uh, and she looked up from her mom's phone. Actually, I went more like this. Ah, <clears throat> uh, I was loud and I was wiggling my body around and she was sitting kind of like off to this side. So she caught me out of the corner of her eye, this extreme body gesture, and then she caught the strange vocal inflection. So she looked up and she did this. And then she went right back to playing with her mom's phone. I got about four and a half seconds of her attention. And the reason she looked up is she had a need to know. Her need to know was, what the heck is that woman doing? Did she have a stroke? Did she falling over? Is something really interesting happening right now? And once she was able to account for the discrepancy, which is, no, same old thing. She's just doing something that has to do with this workshop. Then she lost her interest and she went back to the phone. So we only got that few seconds of her focused, concentrated attention. Now, about an hour and a half later, I went up to this little girl and I said, and we, this was during our workshop resuming, I said, could you tell me what these letters say? And her mom said, oh, she just turned four. She just turned four. We haven't even done letters yet. We have, like, not only did we have this summer, but we have next summer. So next summer we're going to talk about that, but this summer we haven't even started. So she doesn't know any letters. I said, this is just an experiment. I said, can you tell me what these letters say? And the little girl said, ah. Now, she's not ready to use that to read yet, but that is a stepping stone to what readers need which is decoding. They have to see a, sound, a symbol and have a sound pop right out of their mouth, and it's got to be that fast. We took a break about two hours late, well, about an hour and a half later, and I put this on a wall with about 10 other ones, and I did the opposite. I went to the little girl and said, could you go point to the letters that say, ah, and she was able to take the sound and identify the culprit that made it. That's a stepping stone to what writers have to do when they're encoding or spelling. They have to hear the sound they need and then be able to identify what symbols they could use to put it down in a word. She can do both of those things, not for the purpose of reading or writing yet, but she can do those two most hard things that our upper grade kids struggle with. We have third and fourth grade kids who would see a symbol and in no way would they have immediate ability to toss out a sound and that's after working on something for a week or two weeks or two years. And she's four and didn't even try to learn. She got stuck with that. That's the really neat part. It's non-conscious learning. She had a need to know that I triggered with a vocal inflection or an extreme body gesture, anything that causes the brain to need to alert to attention to identify what's going on. And it's, a, it's actually a survival mechanism that you do that. That's why you survived uh, the dinosaur days, because when you heard a strange scratching at your cave, you actually got up to figure out what was happening. Those who ignored it and didn't attend to that strange need to know were probably gulped and eaten down. So we are here today because we have that 
need to know. And when it's triggered, we respond. So we got about four seconds of golden time, and if you use that time to trigger the other areas of our brain that are equally receptive, that's when you start to put stuff in really fast, really deep, and really easily. I call it non-conscious learning because I wasn't trying to teach it, she wasn't trying to learn it, she just looked up at the perfect time and then got stuck owning that. Now if she were in my class, I would give her lots of opportunities to see how powerful that key is to unlock words. I would talk about it when we're looking at the word August. I might even let her draw a little heart around um, words like Austin or awful if she saw it in the classroom. I don't know what will happen when she goes home. Maybe her mom, when she's reading a bedtime story to her, if she sees a word in the story, or maybe a calendar on the fridge, maybe she'll notice it and go, ah, maybe she won't. But in the classroom, when we toss something out, and I like to call it putting it on a buffet, when I, because I'm not teaching it. I would never teach a four-year-old the AUAW secret. That would be silly. I didn't teach anything. I just told a story. And anybody who happens to want to grab what's inside of it, they're welcome to do that. So I'm not teaching it, it's on a buffet. If I were teaching it, I'd be a waitress and I'd be putting it in front of you and I'd be expecting you to eat it and until you eat it, I'm not gonna give you the next thing. This is a buffet. When you go to a buffet, you don't eat everything at the buffet. You've got your, what? <laughs> You've got options. You might eat everything at the buffet or you might lose a lot of money because you barely ate anything because you just ate cake and steak. I mean, you eat what you want and you are the decider of what you need and when you need it. And with the code, that comes in really handy because with the mouse that I want to write about, I know what I need and it's not here. And I don't want to wait two years for the waitress to get it to me. I need it now. And I might need it long before other things that she has on her plan to bring me first. So developmental readiness would dictate that we don't want to teach something kids aren't ready for, but I didn't teach that. She wasn't even paying attention in that whole time we were doing our workshop, except for the moment we triggered that need to know. And that's kind of a magical thing if you think about it, because the rest of the workshop, I'm sure I sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. Blah, 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 blah. The only time she looked up to smell the coffee was when I, and it's like a remote I had to control her brain. I got her attention, and then I maximized that five and a half seconds. The way that it actually goes in, and the reason or the, 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 the methodology behind how this works is that the brain develops back to front. So the earlier developing centers that we're gonna tap into are the social emotional centers. And we hear a lot about social emotional learning, but it's usually for the purpose of behavior. Think about the level of memory and recall kids have when they're discussing behavior. They could tell you who the line leader is, who the line leader was, who got fired from being the line leader, why they got fired, what the punishment was, who's never allowed to be the line leader again, who can't be a, run a runner, they can't, they know everything about your classroom. And they know everything about everybody's behavior. And if you have a sub in your classroom right now, I'm sure they are getting an earful. <laughs> and you will get an earful when you get back about everybody's behavior. This is the stuff that really resonates with kids. And it's not just <clears throat> because they are interested in it, it's because it's living in an area of the brain that's actually much more um, developed, which means there's more connections, it's easier to retrieve information, and it's easier to store. So this earlier developing center is the one we're gonna trigger, and I'll show you how in a second. The higher level executive processing center is the typical place we teach to. That's when we say things like T says T, -t like in the word turtle, Tom, and turkey. Now B says B, B, like in the word big, and box, and Ben. Which, who can tell me what this letter says? Okay, no, 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 that's D. We did D yesterday. D was as in dog, and, and donkey, and what? That's higher level processing. It requires other information be in place for you to make sense of it. This social emotional area doesn't. And what it does have that makes sense is already intact. So this is where we are triggering as opposed to here. Now, I said earlier developing center of the brain, if you teach in an upper grade, even if you have upper grade you know, adult ed learners, the higher level processing center is not really your best friend either for putting information in, mainly because foundation needs to be strong in order for it to function well. You can't think at a higher level about something you don't own. So if there are holes in the skill base, if there are big gaping holes in their skill ability, then you trying to take other information through the higher level processing centers is ripe with landmines. So the back door is just across the board the best way to not say something 14 times and have it really hit the cord. Now, the way that we trigger the preferred area of the brain to engage over the less preferred area is uh, by wrapping up the content in a social emotional cloak or disguise. So what we did was, by putting this emotional trigger into this otherwise totally abstract phonics skill, 
we were able to cause engagement to occur here, where we attend to social feedback, feel embarrassed, actually marked other areas as well. But we should never feel embarrassed or attend to social feedback when we hear the AUAW phonics skill. The only reason we would is if it's wrapped up with these social triggers, these emotional triggers. When she gave me that sound back, she went like this. Ah, it was strange. Her voice sounded like mine. Her head tilted the same way. She wiggled her little body. But she wasn't memorizing all those things and ticking them off on a box. She was feeling a feeling that just landed her in the sound. So the feeling came first, and then sound popped out. That's very different from having to remember a sound based on a word that you may or may not know if you're ELL, and that even if you're not ELL, you may not know how to spell it, which means knowing that the first sound you hear in the word dog doesn't really help if I don't know how to spell the word dog anyway, because although I might hear the duh, it doesn't relate to that circle and stick up there. So you're connecting a lot of dots that aren't in place when you're going through the front door. When you're going through the back door, they can pull the information they need to read a word or pull the information they need to write a word, but they can pull it from a place that doesn't require anything there to start with. That's how we can get around the developmental issues that a lot of kindergarten teachers worry about, which is developmental readiness. You know, I mean, some teachers are thinking, you know, how much can we push kids? Kids need to play, they need stories, they need music, they need imagination, but that's the area we're using. That's where we're playing. That's where all of these things are living. And it's a buffet because you're not expecting them to give something back to you. You're giving them access to what they need and then modeling how handy it comes in or how delicious that chicken salad is on your buffet. Now, imagine that you are, uh, you are teaching an R-controlled vowel lesson and you pull out page 16 because you want to use page 16 because you love page 16's way of teaching the R-controlled vowels even though page 16's in an old reading series that you're not supposed to use but you've hidden it in your cabinet so that nobody knows because you'll get in trouble if anybody finds it. But you love it and you would never throw it away because it really knocks out some of these skills, one of which is R-controlled vowels. If you teach R-controlled vowels on page 16, the odds that you're gonna trigger multiple areas in the brain are much slimmer than if, let's say, kids saw or you did this. ER, IR, and UR love to go riding in cars, but they are terrible, awful, horrible, no good drivers. They don't even have driver's licenses, and they always have to slam on the brakes and say, Now, I bet my page 16 would not have made you laugh. Something triggered, probably her face going, and if that were you as the teacher doing that, it really rings a lot of chords. So all of the things that you felt, thought, experienced, all those things become anchors that hold that information in place. So that when kids see these, and they don't think of them as, oh, those are the art controlled vowels. No, they just go, Arr! but that's okay, because isn't that what we need them to do as a reader? We need them to see this, and a sound pops out. Or we need to be able to go, T and have them know immediately where they can go to find out what their options are to make it. So it, they don't have to take the long way around if we've got these shortcuts to make short work of stuff. Now, basically, we are seeing it, saying it, doing it, feeling it. When we've gone to school over the last 10 or 15 years, we hear a lot about multi-sensory instruction, multiple modality learning, but it's always see it, say it, do it, and we never hear the feel it part. The feel it part's actually the most powerful of all because the emotional networks, the emotional systems, when those engage, it heightens the state of alert that then makes everything else come at a deeper uh, level of connection. It's, it's much deeper learning because there's an emotional connection to it. Mary Helen uh, Imordino Yang is a Harvard neuroscientist and her whole focus of work is attaching emotional significance to abstract critical and difficult skills. Because any way you can find to cheat, like we did, where you put emotion where there is none, you know, how do you teach emotion to go, how do you put emotion with a phonics skill or a chemistry symbol or an algebra equation? It's pretty hard to put emotion where there is clearly none to be had, <clears throat> but we can get creative. And there is a quote by Einstein that I love that is, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. And to me, that's kind of what we're doing. We're just saying, well, if the fact is there's no way to do that, well, then let's make new facts. And now there is. So that's a whole, that opens up a whole other door for where you can go and what we can do. Now this little girl could take all three of those teachers' jobs, and I want to share this because it also was incidental learning in that her mom was at a conference, and this was in um, <clears throat> somewhere in the Midwest. 
And the mom t uh, tweeted this and then sent me a copy. It was, the, it was five days after the conference and the mom was talking to, I guess, at the dinner table about the, the conference and was mentioning that er sound. So she caught her kindergartner, now this little girl's one week into kindergartner, teaching her three-year-old sister what her mom was just telling her husband at dinner. So I, and then she videotaped it quietly. So I want you to just see it because she is ready for a, a job in a classroom. Hi kids, do you want to know about the secrets about these? So E-R-I-R-U-R. -R when they get together, they hop in their cars, they drive crazy, and they say, arr, 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 arr. Yeah, so what they do, drive in their cars crazy. But when you grow up, you don't do that. Okay. Now here's what I love the most. She let the cat out of the bag on where this lives in her brain by what she said at the end. This wasn't our controlled vowel skill being retold in preparation for a spelling test. This was a life lesson. She had connected to that quote unquote skill lots of social and emotional experiences that one would have having been in a car. Like maybe sometimes she was in a car and dad cussed because he had to stop so fast that he almost hit the next car. So that stuck out because mom yelled at dad the whole way home. Maybe one time, she actually hit her head on the, the thing because she didn't put her seatbelt on when the car went. Err. Maybe another time, uh, they actually got on a little fender bender. All those social emotional experiences actually anchor that skill. As opposed to the alternative, which is how many times can you practice the skill? Because however many times you can practice the R controlled vowel skill will dictate whether or not they know that skill before you can move on to the next one. And oh no, over the summer they will slide if they're not continuing to practice that phonics skill and that phonics skill. These aren't skills to them. And you could tell that because she said, now when you grow up, you don't do that. She didn't say, so don't forget to say the er sound in the word turn. <laughs> this was living in a place that had a different purpose. But the beauty of it is, it doesn't make it any less valuable for that purpose. So if she saw the word bird, she could still go, at least with a little modeling. But, duh. And once she connects the dots and things, oh my gosh, I just read that word. I, I get it. I get the letters that are in that word. They're the ones that go, er, and that's why the words, but er, I get it. It's that moment of get itness that is where all kids are different. Some kids instantly get, oh, this is the key to unlock this word and this word and this word, like Johnny. Other kids are like Lulu. They just walk around and go, ah, we love letters, ah. <laughs> they don't get the power of what that key can unlock because they're not yet ready for that cause effect connection, but that's where the modeling comes in. So you're building a buffet and then you're eating from it all day long. And that's really a neat thing too, because programs are not, uh, are not ideal when it comes to the code. Because a program, and that's not what this is, by the way, these are tools to just make sense of things that don't make sense. Programs have a specific amount of time that they're supposed to be taught in a particular order, in a way that you're supposed to do them. Tools are something you can use all day long, and you're going to read all day long. So there's never a moment where they don't maybe need to pull out of their back pocket this one or that one or have access to other things that you have laid out on this buffet. Even that better alphabet that I was mentioning earlier, while you're doing that, I said that takes two weeks to two months, you are simultaneously tossing out secrets. Because if any kid is paying any attention to what you say at all, and you've just said A says A, or A says apple, ah, 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 and then you march two feet to your calendar and you show them the word August, you lose all credibility. Because if they're paying any attention at all, they're going, hey, wait a minute, isn't that exactly the same A over here that's over here? And didn't she just say it's supposed to say at or A? And now she's pointing to it, and not only is she not saying at or A, I think she's making a sound she made for a different letter. I don't know what it is because I don't know my letters yet, but I do recall something else that was supposed to say ah. So that's when the brain starts to turn off and it, tries, it doesn't bother trying to account for discrepancies because the discrepancies become the norm. The brain's a pattern-making machine. It will pull a pattern. The problem is sometimes the pattern is there is no pattern. Anything goes, so it doesn't even matter. So I give up. It just is. It just does whatever. Who cares? We want the opposite. We want kids to follow their nature. Why? 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 You know, we want to keep that analytical diagnostic thinking, and we want it all day long. Stories are another great way to activate these social emotional areas in the brain since we have to come up with a way to trigger them. Stories really do it for us. Stories take you on a journey. 
If they're well-crafted and they happen to cover the content you're trying to teach, that's all the better. Stories also give a perfect framework for memory reconstruction. So kids who are weaker with experience, a lot of kids, it's like someone took them out of a a box, put them on a bus, and sent them to school. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they are. They don't know what they're doing. And they don't have an experience base. Even if you're in fourth or fifth, you get kids some years, and you're thinking, have you even been in school over the last three years? Like, what have you been doing? There's so many holes. And often we've got kids who aren't spoken to at home. I mean, they might be talked at, but they're not talked with. So there are entire missing chunks of things that they don't have experience with, and experience is your sticky tape to hold new things to. So what's nice about a story is it gives you a framework in a vacuum to hold things that are going to go into it. And that's really worth its weight in gold. So stories are a perfect way, a memory enhancer. Now I'm gonna tell you a quick story to get to some bigger points here while I try to get to where I wanna be in the next 20 minutes. This sneaky Y guy, I mentioned he was a high leverage phonics skill, which means he gives you lots of bang for your buck. And so do the vowels, because the vowels are usually behind almost everything that's going crazy when it comes to words. Now, the thing is why he found out one of the biggest secrets there are, which is that there are superheroes in the alphabet. There are five superheroes in the alphabet that have a power that no other letter in the alphabet has. They can say their name, which is not impressive to humans. I know we don't care about saying our name. We think we should be able to fly or breathe underwater. Saying your name is of no value. But if you're a letter who walks around every day of your life and all you do is make the same k sound or b sound, then you'd be thrilled to have this extra sound to make. So they are the envy of every other letter. Now having said that, Y found out their secret. And he was mad because he hated his y sound. So what he did is he snuck into the closets of superhero E and superhero I and he took one of each of their capes, which is where their powers lie. So that now whenever he's at the end of a word and he doesn't think anyone can see him, he will always be wearing either his E or his eye cape so that he can use their superpowers to say their name. Like mom E, dad E, candy, sky, July. If he's at the beginning of a word, he does what every good line leader does. He stands up tall and straight and does what he's supposed to. Yeah, yeah, yellow, yes, you, yak, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when he's at the end, he will always be sneaky and he will always be wearing either his E or his eye cape. Now, if you're wondering, what about words like day or they or play? I'll be there in just a minute. (laughs) Think about from a kid's perspective, if this is really new learning. Kids know where to be sneaky, and they know the place not to be sneaky is the line leader. What do kids look like when they're the front of the line? Perfect, I heard you say it's right. It doesn't matter what their normal behavior is in the classroom, when they are at the front of the line, in that position, they know it is time for perfection, and they look like a walking angel. Now, if they did, let's say, want to smack Susie over the head, where would the best place be to get away with that? (laughs) The caboose, right? Everybody knows you can get away with murder back there at the end of that line because chances are nobody's going to see you. Now, you might get caught, but your odds are a lot better when no one can see you. So it's human nature to do what you're not supposed to do when you're less likely to be seen versus when all eyes are front and center. So this is not new learning. This is kids using the compass that drives their behavior every single day to make a decision about text and words they've never laid eyes on before. That is so powerful if you think about that because it's a thinking construct instead of a memorized sight word. Kids can make a best betting odds call for what a letter's most likely to do in a word they've never seen. Now there is another sound that Y can make but not by himself, which is why sneaky Y can only say E or I. Now this is not sneaky Y, this is E-Y-A-Y and they are just too cool like Fonzie and I can tell looking at your faces that many of you are too young to know who Fonzie is. So this teacher in Washington uh, State is gonna help demonstrate who Fonzie is so you have a personal perspective. A-Y and E-Y. These letters are just too cool. So with thumbs up and their coolest voices, they say, Hey. Hey. Now what that does is it gives kids best betting odds in Las Vegas, which means they can come to a word they've never laid eyes on before and they can roll up their sleeves and make the best call about what sound that Y is most likely to make. As opposed to memorizing every single word that has a Y in it between now and the time in second grade when the scope and sequence decides to share it. The the difference between that's night and day. How much reading is not going to get interrupted if they can make their way through Words that have a letter that's one of the most frequently used letters in almost every word kids are going to see, or every sentence kids are going to see. Everything in our early grade classrooms, their favorite words are mommy, candy, daddy. The calendar, 
the books that are by authors, the boys' bathroom. That's a valuable skill as early as pre-K and kinder. So how neat is it that we have a way to get it to kids far before they're supposed to? That E-R-I-R-U-R secret that that little first, year, first uh, week kindergartner was doing, do you know that skill sits on end of first grade scope and sequence and for a couple reading series, second grade, beginning of the year? Why wait? This wasn't four days into kindergarten. Why wait? Why would we want to wait if we don't have to? Now, uh, Sanford did a brain study, and I love brain studies, but I especially love when universities do them because I don't think they've seen real kids for a long time. Like, not real kids, and if they have, they haven't seen 30 of them in a classroom licking the carpet like we see on a daily basis. So they, they did a study, and it was a fascinating study. It was great information, but again, there's a gap between what we find we need to do versus what is practical in the classroom, but not anymore. But what they came up with as they did this study was that when they measured the distance using a CAT scan um, or the difference between brain circuitry when kids decode a word versus call it, and by the way, calling words, sight words in some states, kids have upward of 300 words by the end of first grade they have to memorize because the sight words become the band-aid to fill in the gap before kids have the skills they need to read the words. You know, kindergartners still have to read at a level G or a level H or whatever your district uses. But if you don't have any of the sounds you need to read the words with and you're not gonna get them for a year or two, how do you do it? Sight words. So sight words are the fill-in, that's what we often have to use while kids are learning to read. And if you're teaching in an upper grade, they're the band-aids that start not holding water as new vocabulary is introduced and those vocabulary words aren't the words they know, quote unquote. But this study basically said that there's no comparison in the brain circuitry between word calling and actually decoding a word, none. All the optimal brain circuitry, everything that is engaging, all the areas that are involved with decoding are 10, 10 times more weight in terms of their value than anything that you see when kids word call. So their end, their end recommendation is never have kids memorize words they could read. Now the problem is they didn't account for the fact that kids can't read anything in the early grades. So we're not memorizing for fun. If we teach kinder first, we're memorizing words because these are skills and words kids don't have yet. And if they don't have the skills yet and won't get them until first or second grade, we got to be able to read. So we have to memorize like their, their word her, for example. We have to memorize the word her because they're not going to get the er sound until too late. The word the, they're not going to get the th until first grade. So we might decide to go ahead and try to teach it early, but there's a ton of words that they can't read, like all these, as a matter of fact. But now imagine if they could. Imagine if they had a way that the reading of the word was actually easy for them. They could read by, because it's sneaky why. The word turn to er, the word say, to a, the word were, were er. So if you have a way to take advantage of the research, we absolutely would want to do it. And the, the, the neat part is, you know, when you memorize a sight word, what you get out of that deal is one sight word. When you own a tool, you get hundreds of words. And the more you read, the better a reader you are, and the more compounded the interest is that pays. So it's, it's awesome to be able to have a link to make that connection. And the, I do um, an, a keynote series with a couple of the, my personal mentors, uh, Dick Allington and Ann Cunningham. And one of the things that Dick says is three to four years is too long to wait for the whole code. And that is a profound thing if you really th think about it. Um, and having said that, by the way, I also work to connect the research to the practical application. So this was right up my alley in terms of knowing why teachers don't naturally do this and yet how they can take advantage of what we know about the brain science if they have a path to, to, to do it, to actually give kids a way to read words that otherwise they wouldn't be able to. A teacher sent me this. This was in a high poverty area in West Virginia, um, and it was the third week of first grade. And she uses a particular reading series that I won't, well, did I name it already here? Yeah, okay. And it's a good reading series. All of our reading series, by the way, are good reading series because they are playgrounds to stretch our reading and writing muscles. You just don't want to look to your reading series to introduce skills that kids need yesterday. So the reading series is where you get to play with the skills that you have. And some playgrounds are better than others, and you might like some playgrounds more than others. But in her playground, she was supposed to be reading the book Curious George. And it was the third week of school, and it's first grade. And she said, I don't know how we... She, now, she, she actually uses these strategies already. So she said, I, I don't know how we would be using, how we would be reading this, as opposed to just memorizing it like a script, if we didn't have or know the secrets of these letter behaviors. Because otherwise, we'd have to memorize all of these words. And she counted 17 words 
that uh, kids would not have been able to read, not just in her year, but until the following year, based on the scope and sequence of the actual reading series. So with just four particular tools, she could crack all of those words. And the reason that's important is you're teaching the reader then and not the reading. If you just practice the story every week, you're memorizing a script, kind of like they do in Hollywood. And then on Friday, you're putting on the show for the camera, and then you get a new script next week, and you forget a lot of what the old script had. You want to give them the tools to actually be doing the reading, and then those tools, she said, we needed C-E-C-I-C-Y, I try Z emphasize, O-U-S, and E-R-I-R-U-R. -R. Those four that crack those 17 words, I bet in the next week's story, she'll need them again. So the tools just keep on coming, keep on being used. Kids just get more crafty with the hammer and the screwdriver and the wrench. They're not memorizing, they're reading. So all the hours that we're putting into working on reading and writing in kinder and in first and in second, and then the payback that we're having to deal with in third, fourth, and fifth, all of that's teaching the reading, and it's not going into the reader. The reader is where it holds, where it's going to actually stick. So I love this. This, and then I'm going to tell you this one other thing too. A teacher came up to me. This was two weeks ago. It was a kinder conference. And she said, I have to tell you what a kid did. He's, he's got a little Asperger's. He came up to me and he goes, I can't turn it off. I just can't turn it off. And the teacher said, what are you talking about? He goes, the reading. I can't turn it off. I, I see words and I keep seeing secrets everywhere and I just keep reading them and I can't turn it off. He goes, I used to be able to just look at words and I could just see letters. But now every time I look at words, I just keep seeing secrets and I just keep reading them and I can't turn it off. And that's what we want. We want kids who can't turn it off. Summer slide happens and it takes away a lot of the hard work we do all year. And then the next year's teacher inherits a kid who can't do the work she has to do because she's got to go back and teach the stuff that we already taught and all of it's subject to summer slide again. And the value that they're getting out of the daily reading and writing is minimal if they don't have enough to bring to the table to do it with because the best way to become a reader and writer is to read and to write, but you have to have something to read and write with. So all of that to say, the ability to not turn it off is the key piece. Dick says, Dick Allington, what he, one thing he says that I also find interesting, and this is where we can disagree, is he said, um, you know, kids that don't know, well, actually we agree on this part, kids that don't have access to text are at a, at a greater disadvantage. Well, absolutely, if you don't have books at home, or parents that can read, or access to text, you're at a horrible disadvantage compared to kids who get to read every night. But there's text everywhere. There are billboards in neighborhoods, there's litter on the ground, there are concert announcements that for last weekend, if kids can't turn it off, they can't help but keep reading things. And every bit of reading is reading. Now the odds that your 10 sight words, boy, girl, she, hit, and were, are gonna be on the billboard are 10 to one. But if you know the ow and the ing and the oi and the sh and the er, if you know all the tools, then you're gonna be like the little kid who can't turn it off. If I showed a word to you right now and said, I'm gonna show you this, but I don't want you to read it. Okay, I'm just gonna show it to you, I'll tell you when you're ready to read it. As soon as I show it to you, you've read it, you can't help it. You can't turn it off either. So teaching the reader means they can't turn it off. And that's what we want. We want to teach so they can't turn it off. That way, everything we invest our time in is going to stick. It's going to stay. Um, code is best served on a buffet, not divvied out in pieces. And the more tools bring, uh, learners bring to the table, the more value they take away. Otherwise, you are an overworked waitress, and you are tossing things out at grade levels that may or may not accommodate their need to, can't actually possibly accommodate the need kids have to write the stories they want to tell and read the books that they're interested in. Now, just to show you a couple things really fast, because I know my time is going to go away from me. This is just to show that, that better alphabet that I was talking about, uh, the power of it, one month in, to see what kids could come up with off of the top of their head to write what it is that they were um, prompted. The prompt was, in the fall, I like to. They were given those words, in the fall, I like to. They had to tell me what? Actually, they didn't get I like to. They got in the fall. They had to figure out how to write I like to and whatever they said. This little guy wrote in the fall I like apps. Now keep in mind, it's one month in, so he's probably got at least half to all of his individual letters plus four or five or six secrets. That's a lot to bring to the table to write about what you like in the fall. Uh, in the fall I like to pick pucks. I love this one in the fall. I like to make puck and pie. I love the sneaky Y in the word pie. But this was my favorite. In the fall I like to go trick-or-treating. <laughs> I love the multi-purpose use of the sneaky Y. It can say E, it can say I, it can say yeah, I can do all kinds of things with this letter. But I especially like that she can't write it yet. I like that she's making use of a high-level 
second grade skill, and she hasn't yet mastered how to write the letter Y. One thing's supposed to be easy, the other thing's supposed to be hard. So in what universe could she do the hard thing, but she can't do the easy thing? In the universe where we switched things upside down. We made the hard thing easy. It's non-conscious learning. Writing a Y is not non-conscious learning. You have to use repetitious practice. That can take time, especially if you have weak muscles. You know, can't get around the physical, but we can get around the brain. That's where things are so special. The brain isn't a leg that just does what it does. The brain has these other ways to play. It's like a chess opponent. And if you know what its likely next step is gonna be, then you can counterbalance that by taking a detour in a different direction and forcing its hand to do something else. So it's a very easy opponent to read and then to cheat. Now, this is where we end up in the fall. I mean in the spring, and this is kinder, and I know it looks insane. It looks about two years beyond what grade level uh, would be, but it's actually not as impressive as you would think when we look. It is impressive, but for a different reason because it's not being written in the normal way. You can see a lot more examples of this on the site and also see transition into first, but the reason I want to show you it is uh, there's a purpose to it. I'm a dolphin. I live in the deep blue sea. This is an average one. Um, I could, uh, I, there are sharks, but I could kill them with my nose. I could camouflage, so when sharks swim by me, they notice A-Y instead of E-Y. Not enough text experience yet to know which one's right to spell, but it tells us he owns a tool that he could use to read. Uh, they cannot see me, not quite grasping that the word C doesn't have a sneaky Y in it. This is a kid who I can tell isn't doing a lot of reading yet at home, or he would know how to write the word C. Certainly long before he would try to take a leap to write the word camouflage. You know, that's the interesting part. Most kindergartners don't write much at all, and if they are writing, it's because they've been read to at home. And the only words kinders are writing are words that they've seen in the books they've been read. The reason that is, is they're not building from whole cloth because they don't have any skills yet. Kindergartens don't, they don't have phonics skills yet, so they're not building and putting it together as they go. They're transferring words that they remember. He's building as he goes, and we know this because of the weird errors, the wrong and yet right choices. Uh, there are coral two I could play all day, there's no place like home. So I love that a kid who still doesn't read much at home could take what he does know and use it to say what he wants in a story and I can diagnostically tell as a reader what he is armed with to attack text. And as a reader it'll come in a lot more handy because he doesn't have to know which one's right for the word the A or for the sneaky Y for C. I love that he can engage whether he has a parent at home that's going to work or not. This is a lower level one. This little guy actually had alcohol fetal syndrome. He was a group of five, one of a group of five that was clustered together for scheduling. And he had a, he'd been adopted, so he had a very supportive parent. Um, he wrote, uh, I had a fun swim, I jump high. I love that his sight memory told him, because he was read to a lot at home. His sight memory told him there was an I in the word high, but yet he was, he's SLD, he does exactly what you tell him. So he's like, but I better put a sneaky Y there, because sneaky Y is supposed to say E or I, so I'll put them both, and that way I know I'm right for sure. <laughs> I love that tenacity. Uh, it's fun too, I had a great time swimming and now I'm tired. Now, the word now and OU, he knows OU and OW play really rough, someone always gets hurt and says, ow! But flying overhead of superhero, of, of OW is superhero O, because he's their all time favorite superhero ever. And if he ever flies by, they will stop dead in their tracks and go, oh, 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 oh! Kids need that for a default. Something else to try for words like blow, flow, glow. They need to have a trick up their sleeve, and if not, then this. That's how they're going to do that critical analysis and thinking and have the best betting odds for Las Vegas. He picked the wrong one, but it tells us as a reader, he would be able to crack a lot of words if he owns that OUOW. Think how much reading he can do with those tools that we can see through his writing. Now, I love this the most, though, the word great. It's so wrong and yet so right. <laughs> I love that he thought he had to put an E there, and he's the kind of kid who never puts what he doesn't hear because he only remembers things for a few minutes and then they usually disappear. There's only one reason he put an E there, and it's not because he understands silent E. He put an E there because he thinks that is mommy E. And he knows if mommy E is one letter away from another vowel, she will tell that vowel, you say your name, and by darn it, you will, because I'm close enough to reach over that letter's head, get a hold of you, and make you say your name. And that's why he put mommy E there, because he didn't want his word to be grat. He wanted his word to be great, so he had to have mommy there. But if mommy was two letters away, like in this word, bitter, she could yell and scream all she wants. Her little arms are only about three inches long, so they're too short to reach over both of those T's to get a hold of him, make him say his name, and that's why that word's bitter and not biter, which is what it would be if I were one letter away and could get a hold of you. <laughs> So kids already behave based on proximity. They know if you're close enough, they're going to do it. But if you're all the way on the other side of the room when you're doing this, stop, stop, 
They might not stop because <laughs> they know you're probably not going to walk all the way over there to make them stop. So proximity dictates their behavior, and that's an easy learning curve for this. Now, sometimes mommy's got to get out of the house. She can't take it anymore. And when she's got to get out of the house, she'll put a babysitter in charge. So boys and girls, if you see any vowel that's one letter away from another vowel, it's the babysitter. It's going to do exactly what mom would if she were there. It's going to tell that vowel that's one letter away, you say your name. And just like you listen to mom, you're going to have to listen to your babysitter too. So now you open up doors to words like motor or making or biker, multisyllabic words, words where there is no nice, neat little E at the end for kids to use as a measure to go long or short. It doesn't help in kinder to teach or in ELL to teach that vowels can be long or short if they don't also get the trigger to know, so which one is it? Because <laughs> otherwise it's like a wild goose chase when you're trying to read. You have to try long, you have to try short. I've worked with upper grade kids where they're reading multisyllabic words and they have no rhyme or reason as to what sound they try. It's like they, and, and you know why? Because this is normally taught like this. Boys and girls, when you have a vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel pattern, you'll divide between the two T's, in which case you'll have what we call a closed syllable, and in a closed syllable that vowel will be short. However, if you have a vowel, consonant, vowel pattern, you will divide after the vowel, in which case we have what we call an open syllable, which then dictates that that vowel will be long. Now that trick will hopefully help you know whether or not a vowel should be long or short in the words that you're trying to read. <laughs> That's a very complex skill. Now I'm not saying, I had a teacher say, but I want to teach that, I like that. Awesome, teach it, but don't make it the bar that if they can't get over, they can't read the words. If you have a way to give them immediate access to text, give it to them. And you know what? That'll be so much more valuable when they're using it to reflect on why what that is that they already understand works the way it does. It's like diagramming a sentence. We don't diagram before we write one. Diagramming sentences is a great way to go back and dissect your writing so that you can write better, stronger, faster. But you understand what dissecting a sentence means or diagramming one once you already have the ability to write it. Now here's where I, where I will wrap up. This is the little guy. Teacher uh, sent this to me. A little guy, ELL, his name was Abel. She said he knew, no, he knew seven letters, no sounds. Did the better alphabet, had him by October, but that wasn't the point. Yesterday I pulled out a book, and I, he pulled out a book. I asked him if he would read to me, and he wanted to read Arthur's Halloween. And she said I was going to take a picture walk because it's a really hard book. And all of a sudden, he started actually reading it. So here he is, and I want to just let you see this because this is October. She said I had no intention of this. He's going to show you the mommy and the babysitters and how easy they are to play with. But she, what I felt was powerful, she said I didn't teach him that. I just want you to know I never taught him mommy ear babysitters. I just finished like D with him last week. We just wrapped up our individual letters and sounds because it took all of the first two months for him to get them. So I had on my guided reading thing that we were going to do blends next. He caught this because in whole group instruction, I was talking about mommy E because we were doing a guided writing activity or we were doing some kind of an activity with our big book. So he overheard it. It was like something she put on the buffet and it was chicken salad and he just wanted peanut butter. He knew the chicken sound was there. He knew how to get it and where it was, but he didn't want it until he did. And when he did, he started to eat it. And when she turned around, he stuck his finger in it. And when she turned around again, he had it all over his face. So this is him with it all over his face. This says hibernate. Hibernate. How do you know that says hibernate? Because it, it has an A. Yeah. Why does it say I? Is the mama e. The mama e. And what do these two say? Uh, uh. What is that A getting to say its name? It's mama e. Good job. Now this next one is babysitter vowels, but I do want to mention she has to redirect a student multiple times. <laughs> Not him, another student. So you'll finally hear her lose her temper slightly in the middle of it. So just ignore that. <laughs> hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you need to do there? Is there a secret in that word? What's that I doing? Color it. What? Go color it. What is that I doing in that word? Into that A. A. What does he tell that A to do? That's right. So try it again. A. Right. The house, Luke, Good job. And all the way to the end, she's going, go, 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 to those other kids. 
Now, I love, this was, to me, this is the definition of teaching the reader and not the reading. He didn't know the word house or look or spooky. He didn't expect to know them. He expected to roll his sleeves up and figure them out. And we've got fourth and fifth graders who don't know how to roll up their sleeves and plow through text they've never seen. They either know a word or they don't and they wait for us to tell them. Or if we force their hand, they do one letter at a time attack. But he had power over text. I love that he didn't know the word house until he went, house? Look, looks spooky. And by the way, OO is actually, he's got to try two different sounds. I don't know if I have that one here, but it's got two different sounds. So he had to shift. There's a reason for two different sounds, kind of like the OW with two different sounds. But having to make those adjustments while he's reading, he's not going to lose that. That's a kid who can't turn it off because he actually owns it. If she just had to memorize the words in Martha's Halloween, that's a lot of instructional time spent for absolutely no payoff because next week when they get another book, he's got to memorize that too. So I love that. And here's where I'll kind of wrap it up. Build a buffet. Eat from it all day long. There's no harm. There's no foul. You're giving kids what they need anyway. You're not forcing anything down their throat. You're not a waitress that's going to demand they eat this before they get that. Give them access to everything that they need so when they need it, it's there. And they will access it all day long. The one thing that teacher said that stuck with me is she said, it's one thing when something is easy to teach. It's another thing when it's so easy to teach you didn't know you taught it. And that's what we can do. We have that power to do that because there are areas of the brain that learn through osmosis. But you have to know how to trigger them and then you have to know how to wrap that, that content up. If you want to stay in touch with me, I would love for you to, and I will certainly try to answer any questions that you have. I am going to be sending out something. I never send out things that are, like, annoying. Like, I never, there's no, there's no, like, get this, or you can purchase that, nothing. It is about things that you're dealing with in the classroom and ways to get around them. I try to do something every other week, um, but I, I will probably be sending something out tomorrow. So you are welcome if you would like to subscribe. And also, if you respond to me, your response will not go to 10,000 people. It will only come to me. So it's a good way also to communicate with me if you have more questions or just want to ask about anything else. So I want to thank you so much for, uh, for coming and for sitting so long. Thank you. Thank you.